morning, everybody. Can we stand to our feet? It's good to see each of you. Everybody online, thank you for joining as well. We will sing in just a minute, but let me begin by reading a scripture. This is Psalm 99. Starting in verse 1, it says, The Lord reigns, let the peoples tremble. He sits enthroned upon the cherubim, let the earth quake. The Lord is great in Zion. He is exalted over all the peoples. Let them praise your great and awesome name. Holy is he. The king in his might loves justice. You have established equity. You have executed justice and righteousness in Jacob. Exalt the Lord our God, worship at his footstool, holy is he. Often we sing about the things that God does in our lives, the way that he changes our lives. Because of that, I just want to read a scripture that talks about the holiness of God and who he is, apart from who we are. He is holy whether or not we follow him. He is worthy of our praise whether or not we do it. So I'm going to pray quickly and then we'll sing to a God who is holy, who's being worshipped in heaven at all times. We get to join in that. So let's pray. God, we thank you that you are a holy God, that you're set apart, that you never change, you're unmoved. And yet you love us, yet you walk with us. We praise the God who is holy today. That's our confession. We ask that you inhabit our praise today, that you be with us now. Let it bring you joy this morning. In your name we pray. Amen. i 
for his goodness. Yes, God, you are good. We thank you for that, Lord. We thank you for that. Can we sing, There's Never Been Anyone Like You? No, there's never been anyone like you. Never been anyone like you. You are worthy. Yes, you are worthy. There's never been. There's never been anyone like you.
up now. God, we praise you. We praise you. God, we thank you. God, we thank you that you have defeated sin in our life. That you've changed everything for us. God, that you're our author, our creator, but you're also our savior. God, we thank you that we are not the same as we used to be. That in Christ we have been made new and that you're continuing that work now. And so we say we praise you. We say that you are Lord and King of our lives. God, this is more than a song, but this is our life. This is who we are. Help us to be living sacrifices that are worthy of you. Help us to do that on a daily basis in mundane, routine moments, God, to truly be surrendered to you. Because we know that you are deserving of that. God, our prayer now is that you would move in this church that the rest of the service would absolutely be for your glory and for your will. Help eliminate distractions. Help us to focus on the word. God, we ask that we'd hear from you today, that you'd pierce our hearts, that we'd have ears to hear you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. 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 You guys, thank you so much for singing such a treat. You can go ahead and take your seat. Good morning, friends. Welcome in Jesus' name. Have you thought about the words of Jesus when he says, I am the good shepherd? He goes on in the passage and says, my sheep hear my voice. I know them and I give eternal life to them and they shall never perish and no one shall snatch them out of my hands. Friends, you and I are secure in Jesus Christ because he is glorious because he's powerful, because he's resurrected, he's seated at the right hand of God, and he's coming in power and glory. Well, hey, if you're visiting this morning, my name is Mark. I'm one of the pastors here. And uh, I just want you to know we are really glad that in the providence of God that you're here this morning, because God has a plan to touch you, to move in your heart and your life. So wherever you're at in the journey, I just want to encourage you to draw near to him. Uh, My wife and I are up in Alaska with our oldest son today. We're at his church and uh, enjoying the fellowship there. And we're going to be racing back this week. So come next week and introduce yourself at the end of the service. Now, just a couple of quick things as we look forward. September 11th is our kickoff Sunday. It's kind of where, again, we start up in the fall and everything starts to happen. You're going to want to come and participate in that day. You're going to want to bring the kids. We're going to have a trout pond out there. They're going to have fun catching fish. We're going to have axe throwing. We're going to have jumpy house. We're going to have food. It's going to be great. We're going to celebrate coming back together uh, and launching off all of our fall Bible studies. And that becomes really important. Wherever you're at, again, in your spiritual journey, there's a series of studies that are happening here at the church. Men's studies, ladies' studies, uh, group studies, different sizes. So Sunday morning, we've got our our large gatherings. That's great. We have about 1,000 people that show up on Sundays, and we minister to one another, and we celebrate what God is doing. And then we break down into mid-sized groups. And so these mid-sized groups will all be launching then. And then our home Bible study. So get involved, be encouraged, be blessed. This morning, we're going to be in 1 Samuel 17. That's the story of David and Goliath. And hey, this story isn't for little kids. It's for big kids like you and me. So let's turn there and let's welcome Pastor Nate at this time. Well, good morning. Welcome to Revive Church. Glad you can join us here. Uh, As Pastor Mark said, my name is Nate, one of the pastors here. It's a joy to get to open the word with you today. Uh, And Mark mentioned that we have a number of studies coming up. And so just to give you a sense of what's coming, uh, Wednesday night, circle it on your calendar. That's family night here at Revive. And so we've got stuff for the kids, uh, two-year-olds all the way up to fifth grade. Uh, Juana is starting for them. Youth group is starting up for sixth through twelfth graders. Same time on Wednesday night. No, same time all across the board here. Uh, We've got some women's studies coming up. So ladies, we've got... 
a Matthew study. That's the precepts study through Matthew, inductive Bible study. And also we have an entrusted parenting class. It's a wonderful class. My wife Angela took it last, last year and it was really helpful for us. So I encourage you to consider that. And then anyone who wants to, you're welcome to come join us for the story of the Old Testament. I'll be teaching that in the sanctuary on Wednesday evenings. And we're going to be going through one book of the Old Testament each evening. And so it's a fast pace, but we're just asking three questions. How does this book tell us? What does this book tell us about God? How does it fit the story of salvation? And how does it point forward to Jesus coming? And so we're doing the poetic and prophetic books there on Wednesday night. Uh, also, whether you're single or married, we've got something for you. So two new ministries starting, Single Beans and uh, the Marriage Ministry. So join us for those things. Get plugged in. Pastor Al's got a study coming up on Jesus' I am statements in the Gospel of John. What does Jesus say about who he is, why he came? Pastor Al's going to take us through that study. And on kickoff Sunday, uh, Pastor Mark mentioned a number of fun activities, but we also have baptisms as a part of that kickoff Sunday. Uh, and baptism doesn't save you, but it's one of the ways we celebrate what God has already done in saving you. And so we want to celebrate with you. So don't rob us of the opportunity to celebrate with you. Come, be baptized. You can find more information online, but next Sunday, 1215 after the third service, meet me in the office. We're going to have a class on what baptism is and, and get you ready for that. So join us for those things. Would you pray with me? Lord, we thank you for another day that you have given us to sing your praise, to bless your name, uh, and to open your word. And so would you help us this morning, would you help us uh, to have our gathering be worthy of your great name? We thank you for all that you've done for us on that cross and, and in regenerating us and helping us to live lives that honor you. And so, Lord, we're desperate for you to come. We're desperate for you to transform us. Would you help us today? We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Because it's my name, because I lie and I sign myself to lies, I've given you my soul. At least let me keep my name. It's the only one I have. I cannot have another. Let me keep my name. Perhaps you remember those famous words of John Proctor in Arthur Miller's writing, The Crucible. The crucible covers the, the Salem witch trials in Salem, Massachusetts. And in this final scene, John Proctor uh, has, has confessed to a crime he didn't commit just to save himself from hanging. But the last step is to sign his name to that confession. And he can't do it because he can't give up his name. Because to him, his name represents his, his reputation, his, his character, his accomplishments, his honor. It's the only name he will ever have, and he cannot sign it. Because that's his name. Your name is precious to you. Dale Carnegie, famous business author, makes this observation. A person's name is the sweetest word to them in any language. Don't you like hearing your name? It's not just a collection of random letters. Those are, that's what people refer to you by. And it represents to you your accomplishments, your, your, your accolades, your, your reputation in this world. And it's sweet to hear, hear your name. Isn't it sweet, Caleb, to hear your name? Jesse, do you like hearing your name? Yeah. Chrissy, do you like it when someone says your name? It's sweet to hear your name. That's, that's who you are. That's your reputation being spoken. And it's sweet to us to hear our name. And many times in life, we have this temptation, this struggle to maintain our name, to maintain our own reputation. We often worry about our own reputation, the fame of our own name. But today, I want to free you from that. I want to free you from the need to maintain your own name. And in doing so, Discover your purpose in life. Whether you're an employer or an employee, whether you're a student or a parent, married or single, God has called you to a specific purpose in life. And it's found in our text today. It's found in our passage today, 1 Samuel 17. Now this story, Pastor Mark mentioned it already. This is a familiar text to many. And it's been preached many times in many different ways. And so uh, in preparation, I just wanted to look over uh, the titles that others have used to preach this text, the story of David and Goliath, 1 Samuel 17. A brief survey of the internet brings up titles like this. Be courageous like David. Face the Goliaths in your life. 
How to defeat giants and receive a miracle. Five smooth stones, five things David did to overcome his giant. Or, of course, our friends at VeggieTales, little guys can do big things too. <laughs> and we, when we read those titles, titles like that, the irony is, message titles like that look at the world the same way that Goliath looks at the world. It's a human-centered way of reading the Bible, as if I'm the main character of the story. Uh, but the reality is, when we read it like that, we're totally missing the main point of the story. And so perhaps you saw that the title of the message today is the throwdown in the valley of Elah. Why not David versus Goliath? Because this story is not about David. And this story is not about Goliath. But there is a battle taking place. There is a throwdown that happens in the valley. And the main character of this story, his shadow looms large over both figures down in the valley on that day. And so there is a battle taking place. But it's the same battle that takes place in every human heart. Perhaps it's taking place in your heart as we speak. That's what we're going to look at today. You got your Bible there. You're with me. 1 Samuel 17, starting in verse 1. The text reads in this way. Now the Philistines gathered their armies for battle. And they were gathered at Sukkah, which belongs to Judah, and encamped between Sukkah and Azekah in Ephes Demim. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered and encamped in the valley of Elah and drew up in line of battle against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on the mountain on the one side, and Israel stood on the mountain on the other side with a valley between them. And there came out from the camp of the Philistines a champion named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. He had a helmet of bronze on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. And he had bronze armor on his legs and a javelin of bronze slung between his shoulders. The shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron, and his shield-bearer went before him. He stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why have you come out to draw up for battle? Am I not a Philistine, and are you not servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves, and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistine said, I defy the ranks of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. And so the big idea, the main thing I want you to catch from our passage today is this. The big idea is you need to live for the fame of the name. Live for the fame of the name. That's the point of the story because God's the main character of the story. And when I say the name, I mean the name of all names. God's name, the Lord's name, the name of God. Live for the fame of the name. And today I want to give you three reasons Three reasons to live for the fame of the name. And I want you to ask yourself, am I living for the fame of his name or my own name? Three reasons today to live for the fame of the name. Now, to catch you up on where we're at in the story, the context here, uh, Pastor James preached last week on 1 Samuel 15. And in 1 Samuel 15, we see that Saul, because of his pride, thinks that he is wiser than God. And so he chooses his way over God's way. And as a result, God rejects Saul as king over Israel. And then the next chapter, 1 Samuel 16, David is anointed as king. And Samuel secretly goes under the instruction of God to anoint David as king. And as he's looking over, so here's Samuel, he anoints David as king. And as he's looking over David and David's brothers, uh, he passes over each of the brothers. They're tall, they're handsome, just like Saul. But God says this to David. But the Lord said to, to Samuel, do not look on his appearance, on the height of his stature, 
because I have rejected him, referring to, to Eliab, David's older brother. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. And so you remember, we referred to Saul as the hollow king. He had it all together on the outside, but his heart was not for God. And now David is anointed because he has a heart for God. And so he's secretly anointed, secretly the next king of Israel. And then our text begins with the battle in the valley of Elah, the throwdown in the valley. And the first thing you need to catch about the throwdown in the valley, the first reason we have to live for the fame of God's name is that God's name is great. His name is great and he will not be mocked. God's name is great. He will not be mocked. You saw there in verses 2 and 3, the setting of our story. It takes place in this valley of Elah. Uh, we saw Sukkah and Ezekiel named there. And so between these two places, this is where the battle happens. And so uh, this valley is a dry riverbed. And so the Israelites are on the hilltop to the north. The Philistines are on the hilltop to the south with this dry valley between them where Goliath's battle will take place. To give you a sense of what this looks like, here, here it is. So Philistines would have been on this side, Israelites over here. On either side, they're high up in that fortified position, and they're at a stalemate. No one wants to come down off of their hilltop to try to run uphill to fight someone else when they can just throw stones at you until you give up and go back to your hill. And so uh, this is where the battle happens, and Goliath marches down into that valley and shouts up. You can picture him, can't you? Shouting up at the Israelites on that hilltop, cowering shouting up to them, bring me a man, let us fight. And Goliath is a menacing figure. The, the Bible spends extra time detailing for us just how fearsome an opponent Goliath is. It says that he is uh, six cubits and a span, which is nine foot six. Nine foot six. If you're walking down the hallway of our church here, his, his head would be scraping the ceiling. So to give you a sense of what this height is like, uh, here on the far left, here's Kevin Hart, and Dwayne The Rock Johnson. Kevin Hart is 5'8". Dwayne Johnson is, is over six feet tall. If these two are in a fight, who do you think is going to win? I'm going to bet on The Rock. He's massive. He's, he's bigger. He can, he can outpunch him. He can outfight him. He can outmuscle him. But if Dwayne The Rock Johnson and Shaq are together... Shaquille O'Neal, he's, he's almost a seven-footer. And so you have Dwayne The Rock Johnson, he's about 6'5", and Shaquille O'Neal is almost a seven-footer. Shaq is way bigger than Dwayne. He's thicker, too. But there's always a bigger fish. And here is Shaquille O'Neal next to Yao Ming, one of the tallest NBA players, at seven and a half feet tall. And he's massive. That's a big man, especially compared to Shaq. Now, now think about that. Here's 5'8". Here's seven, six. There's two feet of difference between them. That's massive. And Goliath is two feet taller than Yao. He's enormous. It tells us his armor weighs 126 pounds. It's like an average, an average high schooler. He wears his armor as he marches into battle. And his weapons are massive. Here's one pastor reproduced roughly what Goliath's spear would have looked like. Do you see the pastor down there? Do you see the spear up here? It's enormous. And, and the, the, the tip of the spear weighs almost 20 pounds. And so imagine nine foot six, covered in 125 pounds of armor, holding that spear down in the valley. He, he's all metal. He's all teeth. He's all sharpness. He is death incarnate walking into that valley. They do not want to fight him. He's a fearsome opponent. And so the, the Israelites are fearful of Goliath because of his size. And he makes that decree. Come on down and fight me. Man to man. You win, no more bloodshed. We'll surrender. If I win, no more bloodshed. You guys surrender. It's a contest of champions. And no one wants to fight. And Goliath makes this statement. The Philistines said, I defy the ranks of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight. Saul and Israel, their response is dismay and being greatly afraid. They're fearful of this loathsome giant. But he makes this statement, I defy Israel. I defy. This is an important word in the text. It's repeated six times throughout the text. And so like the thundering footsteps of the giant through the text, defy, defy, defy. It's the Hebrew word haraf, haraf, haraf. Defy means to taunt, to mock, and to blaspheme. 
And so when he does this, it's not just Israel he's mocking. He's mocking God as he defies Israel. And so here's the word. It's, it's the word haraf. Haraf in Hebrew. Reproach, taunt, blaspheme, defy. Six times in our passage, he defy, defy, defies. He mocks God. That's what's wrong with Goliath. Not that he's just an opponent of Israel, but he mocks God. And you've seen God mocked in, in our society today. We see God mocked. When, when, I, when I look at textbooks, new, new editions come out. When the newest edition of these textbooks came out and all the dates, the numbers are the same, but they change the letters after the date. Have you seen this? Rather than A.D., B.C., Anno Domini, Year of Our Lord, or B.C. Before Christ, they change it to C.E., the Common Era. B.C.E., Before the Common Era. Oh, really, the Common Era. When did the Common Era begin? You're still counting by Jesus' life and death. You just don't want to acknowledge his lordship. You don't want to acknowledge that, that he divides all of human history. And he divides every human heart. We see God mocked in our world today. When people say things like, my body, my choice, we mock God. When someone says, your God, your, your book doesn't belong in our political discussion, you mock God when you say that. Or keep your God out of our school. That's a mockery of God. This school board meeting, don't, don't utter God's name here. It's mocking God. Or God doesn't get to tell me how to behave in my relationships. It's mocking God. God can't tell me about, about my gender or sexuality. That's a mockery of the God who has made you. God will not be mocked. And so when we see God mocked, he's harassed, we already know this giant will fall. And when you see God mocked in our world today, just know the mockery will not last forever. Have confidence. Take heart. It will not last forever because God will not be mocked. That's the first thing we see. God's name is great and he will not be mocked. That's the first reason we have to live for the fame of the name. And the second is like it. God's name is great and he will be honored. He's not going to be mocked. He's going to be honored in our world. And so Goliath marches into that valley. And for 40 days, every day, Goliath marches into the valley, mocks God, blasphemes God, mocks Israel, and marches back up to the Philistine camp. Unbeknownst to him, God is working in the background. And Jesse sends his son David to the front of the battle lines with provisions for his brothers, with food for his brothers. David gets to the battle line just in time to hear the 41st time Goliath stomps down to the valley to hurrah, hurrah, hurrah. It says this, And as he, David, talked with his brothers, as he talked with them, behold, the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, came up out of the ranks of the Philistines and spoke the same words as before, the mockery. And David heard him. Something changed this time. David hears the mockery. David, who has a heart for God, David, who loves God, hears God's name mocked. And all the men of Israel... When they saw the man, they fled from him and were much afraid. But David hears the defiance of the giant. As the text goes on, it says, And the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man who has come up? They're still aghast at his size. Surely he has come up to defy Israel. That's our word haraf again, to mock, to blaspheme. And the king will enrich the man who kills him with great riches will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. And so everybody else is fearful of the giant, but kind of enticed by the reward. The wealth, the marriage, the, the freedom, no longer are you going to have to pay taxes to Saul or be conscripted into the army. You're a free man now in Israel. And then David speaks. And this is the first time we hear King David speak in the Bible. And up until this point in our story, the name of God has been absent. Other than Goliath slandering it, the name of God has been absent in the story. And now David speaks. What does David care about? Look at what he says. 
David said to the men who stood by him, what shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? That's the same word again, the haraf from Israel, the mockery, the blasphemy. For who is this uncircumcised Philistine? So this God hater that he should defy. That's our word again, haraf, the armies of the living God, that he should mock the living God. And the people answer him the same way, saying, so shall be done for the man who kills him. But David's concern is for the name of God. The people remind him of the rewards, of the, of the riches, but David's concern is for God's name. And so what does David care about? What's he concerned about? National security? No. The great reward? No. The thrill of battle? No. The beautiful maiden? No. What is he concerned about? This giant is mocking God. Why can he mock God? Who's going to stop this insanity of the mockery of God that's happening? Who will stop it? That's what David cares about. First time he speaks, first thing we hear, David cares about the name of God. That's his concern. His brother Eliab overhears this, and Eliab is embarrassed by his little brother. Eliab, who, who wanted to be king, but he had all the outward appearances of king, but not the heart of a king. And so Eliab is upset because when David says this, it reveals the deficiency in his own heart. What should every man of Israel thought when they heard Goliath blaspheme God? They should have thought, this giant can't stand. This giant will be silenced. God will not allow his name to be mocked. That's what Saul should have said. That's what Eliab should have said. That's what every Israelite should have said. And so when Eliab hears his brother say this, he's convicted. He, he realizes, I should have said that too. I should have stood for the fame of the name. And, and perhaps you felt that in life. When you, when you see someone else standing for the fame of the name, it reveals sometimes weaknesses in our own heart. Or when you stand for the fame of the name. It's going to cause conviction in others and they're going to, they're going to mock you for it. They're going to dislike you for it. That's what we see happening here. And so word gets to Saul that someone is willing to fight the giant. And so Saul brings David in and he looks at him and realizes this is just a boy. He says, you're just a boy. Goliath has been fighting since he was a boy. Now he's a man. You can't fight him. And here's what David says in response to Saul. But David says this to Saul. But David said to Saul, your servant used to keep sheep for his father. And when there came a lion or a bear and took a lamb from the flock, I went after him and struck him and delivered it out of his mouth. And if he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and struck him and killed him. What did David do to the lion? I caught him by his beard and struck him. He grabs the lion by the beard and kills it. I don't want my hand that close to a lion's mouth. But David says, I've fought beasts before. I've struck them down. And, and this Philistine who's mocking, 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 he's all teeth, he's all growl, he's just like one of them. And God was with me then, he'll be with me now. We will silence the slander of this giant. David has confidence in God. Why does he have confidence? The Lord delivered me then. He'll deliver me again. God has providentially prepared David for this day. Because in God's economy, no experience is wasted. Even your pain, no experience is wasted. And so it reminds me of what Dale Ralph Davis says about this. He says, faith is sustained in the present as it remembers God's providence in the past. When you look back over your life, do you see the hand of God? Do you see the places where he has intervened for you? When circumstances seemed beyond your control, the pain was too great, the fear was too great, but he was with you in that moment. And it's remembering that that can give you confidence in the present, that, that circumstances have changed, but God hasn't changed. That's how you sustain your faith. And so David here remembers what the Lord has done. So he makes that statement. Uh, he shall be like one of them because he's defied, he's mocked, he's, he's harassed the living God. David remembers God's providential hand in his life. It sustained him. 
And the great irony in this, in this text is that Saul is speaking with David about fighting the giant, but Saul is the one who ought to be fighting the giant. Remember that Saul is head and shoulders taller than every other Israelite. He's tall, he's strong, he's handsome. And he's the king. What did the Israelites want in a king? We want a king who will judge us, who will go before us and fight our battles. Here they have a king who cowers before the giant. Saul tries to fit David into his own armor. It doesn't fit. And the great irony is it doesn't fit because David's tiny. Saul is massive. And so David says, no, I need to go just with the equipment I have. I can't use your armor. Try to be you. Try to be a mini Goliath. That's not what we're going to do. And so David goes to battle with just his sling and the stones. And so this reminds us, Saul wouldn't honor God's name. So someone else was raised up to honor God's name. If you and I, if we won't honor God's name, God will use someone else to honor his name. His name will be honored. Jesus says, if, if, if you won't praise me, even the rocks will cry out. God will get the praise he is due. If you won't do it, somebody else will. And so do you honor God? When you speak of him, do you honor God? Do you recount the tales of what he's done for you to others to celebrate and honor his hand in your life? When you speak of God, do you honor him? Because God's name is great. God's name is great and he will be honored. He will get the honor and the glory. We've seen God's name is great. He's not going to be mocked. His name is great. He's going to be honored. And the third reason we have today to live for the fame of the name is that God's name is great and he will be victorious. We know the giant will fall. We know that David will win. We know that God will win. He will be victorious. And so the Philistines likely are already, already writing the news headlines. Just like Dewey defeats Truman, Goliath stomps another Israelite in the valley. They're ready to, to, for the presses to roll. But David picks up his sling and heads into that valley. So with his stick in one hand, five river stones in his pouch, his sling in the other hand, he walks down into the valley of Elah toward the nine and a half foot tall Philistine. As David approaches, Goliath sees him coming. This is the first time in, in 41 days that someone has come out to meet him. It says this, verse 42 it says, uh, and, when the, and when the Philistine, that's Goliath, when the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him. For he was but a youth, ruddy and handsome in appearance. And the Philistine said to David, am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Goliath is insulted by such an unworthy challenger. He's not worth the time it takes to put on my armor and strap on my sword. This, this little boy, this is the best Israel has to fight me. He's insulted by the combatant that was chosen on that day. And so he looks at him and he, he derides him. And so Eliab says, you're a pain. Saul says, you're too green. Goliath says, you're puny and young. But how does God see David? God sees David's heart. And then Goliath does something he should not have done. Do you see what he did there? After he says, am I a dog? Did you come with sticks? I'm insulted. And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. He curses David in the name of Dagon. He says something like, in the name of Dagon, I'm going to kill you this day. That's something he should not have done. Because now it's a God contest. He has made it a God contest and said, in Dagon's name, I'll get the victory today. We know what happened to Dagon. Do you remember the story of, of Ichabod? When Pastor Mark took that music stand and, and knocked it over to remind us of, of when the Israelites, the ark had been taken, it was put into the temple of Dagon as an act of worship to him. The Philistines come back, they find their so-called God face down in the dirt, head and hands broken off. And the psalmist reminds us, of this in Psalm 115. Those who make them idols become like them, and so do all who trust in them. And by the end of this day, Goliath will end up just like his God, face down in the dirt, headless. 
Those who make idols become like them. Those who trust in worthless things themselves prove themselves worthless. And so this is a sobering reminder to us. If we worship trivial things with our life, our impact toward eternity will be trivial. Worship God, serve God, behold him. Paul tells us in Corinthians, when you behold Jesus, you become like Jesus. You begin to love the way he loves, live the way he lived, and honor the things he honors. So we know that Goliath will fall. He will end up like Dagon. Even Dagon cowers before the living God. And so Goliath, in cursing David by Dagon, seals his fate. And as the story continues, Goliath tells David, I- I'm going to feed your flesh to the birds of the air, to the beasts of the earth when I kill you. And then David responds. Here's what David says in response to the trash talk of the giant. Then David said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. Again, that's that word haraf, mocked, taunted, blasphemed. I come to you in the name of the God that you're blaspheming this day. And he says, this day, the Lord will deliver you into my hand and I will strike you down and cut off your head. And I will give the dead bodies of the host of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air and to the beasts of the earth so that all the earth will know that there is a God in Israel and that all this assembly will know that the Lord saves not with sword, And with spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hand. So purpose statement here. Why does David fight? So that all the earth may know there's a God in Israel, and his name is great. And so that this assembly will know, those guys hiding behind me there, so that they will know that God saves, not through human means, through human mechanizations, but through his own means. The battle is the Lord's. He will give you into our hand. David's speech is remarkable. Here's what David says in in, four points to his speech. First of all, I come to you in the name of the Lord. I'm here because I'm honoring his name. Secondly, you have mocked the Lord. Third, I will destroy you. And lastly, the world will know who the Lord is. That's the message David has. That's the sermon he preaches to Goliath. I'm coming to you in God's name. You've mocked his name. I'm going to destroy you and everyone will know who God is. What's David's focus? His focus is singular, honoring the fame of God's name. It reminds me of what Spurgeon said. Happy is he who has one desire if that one desire is set on Christ. Happy is the person with one desire if that desire is set on Jesus Christ. The only one who never fails, the only one who never lets you down is Jesus Christ. And it reminds me of what Pastor Mark says in his book, The Man Code, page 27, talking about the story of David and Goliath. He says this, David was a success, but not because of his bravery education, family position, wealth, or career. He was a success because he pleased God. This is the mark of a real man. Real men pursue biblical success. We know David will win this day. Why? Because he honors the Lord. His one desire is to honor the Lord. And the battle is short. Here's the entire battle. That's 36 words. David's sermon to Goliath is 63 words. The battle is not the main point of the story. It's just the natural outworking of everything building up to this moment. 36 words. It's over in the blink of an eye. Here it is. Here's the battle. When the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet the Philistine. David put his hand in his bag, took out a stone and slung it, and it struck the Philistine in the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead and he fell on his face to the ground. On his face, just like Dagon, dead. He launches this rock. Now, in ancient Near Eastern warfare, the sling was a weapon of war. Just like archers, they'd have companies of slingers. And and an accurate slinger could throw a rock between 120 and 150 miles per hour. Faster than a Clayton Kershaw fastball. 
the stone strikes the giant in the forehead. And he falls on his face, just like Dagon, and the battle's over before it's begun. Like a prize fight that's over in the first round, if the battle had barely started and it's done. Just to display the power of God. Just how overpowered, overmatched Goliath was on this day. Because he wasn't fighting David on that day. He was, bef- he was uh, blaspheming the name of God. He was fighting God on that day. And that's why Goliath falls. And then the author reminds us, he gives us a summary. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone and struck the Philistine and killed him. And there was no sword in the hand of David. Remember, weapons were still scarce in Israel at this time. And so David doesn't bring a sword with him into battle. He has to borrow Goliath's sword to finish Goliath off. The author reminds us this to make sure we catch the main point that God saves by his own means. Not by our means, not not by our human maneuverings, his own means, God will save. Why? Because God's name is great and he will be victorious. And the Philistines run in terror. And so what have we seen today? In the throw down in the valley of Elah, we've seen that God's name is great and then God's name is great. And lastly, God's name is great. Do you get the main point of the story today? It's about the name of God. God's name is great and he won't be mocked. The mockery will not last. He's going to be honored. But if you and I won't do it, someone else will honor his name. And lastly, he will be victorious. He will get the victory. He will get the glory. And that's why we ought to live for the fame of his name. Because his name is great. What he has accomplished on the cross is great. What he has accomplished in creation is great. Live for the fame of God's name because he's great. And I think about that statement that that David makes when when he walks into the valley. He says, I come to you in the name of the Lord. And that's a very unique phrase in Scripture. It only occurs a handful of other times. It happens in Psalm 118, prophetically pointing forward to Jesus. And then in Matthew 21, when Jesus enters Jerusalem on on Palm Sunday, the crowds are singing to him, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. And so it's a picture of Christ there. And then the, the other time it's mentioned is in Matthew 23, when Jesus says, you will not see me again, Jerusalem, Until you say, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Referring to his return, his victorious return to earth. And so it reminds me of of what Isaiah says in Isaiah 25. In that moment, on that day, when King Jesus returns to receive everything he purchased with his blood, in Isaiah 25, here's the song God's people sing to his great name on that day. It says this, On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food full of marrow and of aged well-refined. And he will swallow up on that mountain the covering that is cast over all peoples, the veil that is spread over all nations, and he will swallow up death forever. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces And the reproach, the harraf of his people, he will take away from all the earth. For the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, behold, this is our God. We have waited for him that he might save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. That's the song of the saints. That's the song you'll sing on that last day. And it's all about the name of God praising his name. It's the purpose of all creation. You're a part of the creation. It's your purpose to live for the fame of his name. And it's also the purpose for which Christ came and died. When I think about Jesus being led to that cross, creator God, and they bind creator God with ropes. Did the ropes hold creator God and prevent him from getting away? No, it wasn't the ropes that held him. When they nailed him to the cross, was it the two inch pieces of steel that held the creator God captive on that day? No, Jesus says, no one takes my life from me. I lay it down 
of my own accord. Why does he lay his life down? He lays his life down because of his love for his great name and his people to redeem a people to celebrate and enjoy the greatness of who he is. And so if you haven't trusted in Christ, he paid for your sin on that cross on that day. And so come to him today. Come to Christ and live for the fame of his name. And if you're a follower of Jesus, embrace your purpose in life to live for the fame of the name of Jesus. Would you pray with me? Lord, we thank you for your great name. Thank you for what you've done for us on that cross, making it possible for, for us unworthy creatures to praise you, our creator God. And so thank you that, for your reminder today, Lord, that the mockery we see in our world will not last forever. Thank you that, that you will be honored and that you choose to use us to honor your great name, unworthy as we are. And so, Lord, would you help us this day to truly value, love, worship you for who you are, for what you've done, for your name, your fame, your reputation, and for all that you've done for us. Would you help us to do that, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, please go ahead and stand with us as we close in worship. Sing all the earth. So all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry. These bones will sing. Great are you, Lord. As all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry. These bones will sing great. Are you, Lord? All the earth again. It's all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry. These bones will sing great. Declaration of the earth. So the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry.
God, your name is great. You are great. You are holy. Yes, God, we recognize that today. We acknowledge that today. That you are God who will not be mocked. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. It's your breath. God, we worship you and you alone. There will be no other gods. There will be no idols. Lord, help us to leave this place today more focused on you, more surrendered to you so that when we wake up tomorrow, when we wake up on Tuesday, that we wouldn't easily just drift into the motions as we begin a new week, Lord, but that we would be surrendered to you every single moment, walking into every room looking for an opportunity to be like you, to be a representation of Christ in that place. We thank you, Lord, that your spirit goes with us. You are with us at every moment and every place. We praise you for that. Pray a blessing over every person in here as they go out and begin a new week. Thank you, Lord. We pray all of this in Christ's name. And everybody said, Amen. Awesome morning, you guys. Thank you again for being here. Such a good treat. Yeah. <laughs> Give a hand. We're here for one reason, to glorify Christ. Hope you have an awesome week this week. We'll see you soon.